an underscore in that, or is it just yeah, Or is it underscore screen? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, as you guys are moving it, um, can we try to keep it centered, just in case other people come trickling in later, they don't have to, like, go futzing through you? So if you're on the edge, make new friends, promise none of us bite yet. Um, but... Doo -doo -doo. Getting ready to, yeah, why not? Huh. All right, well, welcome to uh, session six. We're here at the end uh, between us. Uh, this is the final panel. That's Then we have two invited keynotes. You should check those out. They're going to be awesome. Title is Infinite Scroll. Oh, my God. I, is there a way to just bring this closer? There we go. Um, so the title of this panel is Infinite Scroll. Um, we have four awesome presenters, um, just a couple of things. Um, I'm going to keep them on tab. They're going to be 12 minutes each. Uh, the hashtag for this is A6 with Theorizing the Web. I'll be watching that if you've got questions. And uh, also on the live stream, if you're watching, hello. Um, feel free to tweet those either directly at me, Marley Vincent L, or just using the hashtag. I'll be looking for them. Um, we're going to have a Q&A session here. I would invite people to try and keep their stuff under their chairs because we're going to have a microphone in order to make sure that the people on the live stream can actually hear the question, so you're going to have to come down or maybe or project very loudly. So, um, and I think that's it. So we're going to get started on this panel. Our first presenter is Marcella Shablovich. She's assistant professor of communications at Pace University. Uh, she's studying the difference between winning and losing in urban China, which will actually be very helpful for her paper title, which is winning at hashtag failing the viral appeal of loser culture in urban China. So without further ado. Okay, so thanks very much. Uh, so I'm just gonna jump right into it since we have limited time. So when we're studying digital culture, the theme of failure, and particularly failure expressed through memes, has been well studied. Right. Whitney Phillips, uh, for example, has characterized trolling um, as a form of schadenfraud or taking joy in others' pain and failure. Uh, Nick Douglas has examined memes as a visual expression of what he calls internet ugly, uh, arguing that viral fail compilations have the effect of normalizing imperfection. Um, with internet ugly, uh, He's interpreted it as things such as badly drawn rage face comics, nailed it memes, and shitty watercolors, right? Participants tend to sort of bask in the glory of their amateurish and losery productions. Uh, similarly, Lamore Schiffman, uh, her study of memes in the Western context found that one unifying characteristic is an emphasis on flawed masculinity, um, or men who quote, fail to embody uh, the norms of hegemonic masculinity. Um, and uh, Ryan Milner uh, has argued that memes make their evaluations uh, based on the following criteria, fail, what the fuck, WTF, and win. As dominant discourses, these framing devices cast winners and losers in social life and do so with implications for cultural participation. And actually, I would sort of add to that that I think fail, WTF, and win ultimately are all sort of about failure in a way, right? Because even when we're winning at things, they're usually sort of small things that don't seem like really winning in the big scheme. Um, so uh, put simply, finding humor in others' failure, it serves a social function, right? As argued by Richard Smith, uh, schadenfraude cultivates a social emotion that is tied to our need for social comparison. We laugh at those who fail because it makes us feel comparatively better about our own position in the social order. Um, and often, you know, despite featuring individuals who do not conform to dominant expectations, uh, the function of this kind of humor can actually be profoundly normative, right? Take, for example, uh, if we go back in time before the digital to mean-spirited laughter aimed at guests that were invited to take part in Jerry Springer's show, um, or more recently, uh, viral success of people like Antoine Dodson and Michelle Davine, um, which has its roots perhaps in systems of hegemonic masculinity, classism, and racism. Um, ironically, however, digital culture, we can say, has brought about a system in which these laughed at losers, losers uh, may achieve a greater notoriety 
than ever before, turning their failure into a source of income, fame, and ironically, success. Uh, so actually what I want to do today is to examine the meanings behind the explosion of what I'm calling loser culture on the Chinese internet, uh, placing it in the context of this larger discussion of fail, um, and comparing it with this global tradition of schadenfreude. Um, but I also want to consider here whether or not there is a unique sort of Chinese cultural function. Uh, so to begin, I think it's important that we situate any discussion of internet culture in China within the context of the government's public emphasis on harmony and civilization, uh, the attempts to maintain uh, an order in public settings uh, is in and of itself something which much of Chinese internet culture opposes. Uh, and this quote here by Guo Bin Yang uh, captures that perfectly. So the notion of sort of resistance through humor and play he states, it's against this culture of official centricity that the internet culture of humor and play assumes special significance. Play has a spirit of irreverence. It always sits uncomfortably with power. Much online activism and much Chinese internet culture in general is enlivened with this spirit, the spirit of play. Right? And to this we could add, uh, and I want to give a shout out to sort of like An Xiaomina and her work on memes uh, as a form of... Uh, visual sort of resistance on the internet. Other work by scholars such as Trisha Wong and Bing Cheng Meng sort of fall into this category as well. Um, and beyond this, I want to say that dominant cultural norms in China tend to place an emphasis on heteronormative success, right? Uh, which I am defining here as an emphasis on uh, heterosexual marriage, lucrative white collar jobs, home and reproduction, having children. And so uh, I'm going to give you some images here. Uh, hopefully these aren't too blurry from where you're sitting. Um, so these come from the 2015 China Joy, uh, China's sort of largest digital entertainment expo. Uh, and at this uh, event, young people were paying 10 RMB, uh, like a little over a dollar, to tag themselves with labels, okay? So you see down in the bottom corner here these types of labels that you could actually clip to your hair. Um, and a lot of people were doing that. It's sort of also part of this sprout phenomenon, if you've seen the, the bean sprouts that people are putting on their heads. So some of the, the labels were things such as loser, diao si, um, literally meaning uh, penis hair, uh, gay friend, bottom recipient. Uh, the ones that you see here that I want to explain um, down at the bottom, uh, we have from, I guess, your left to right, it would be yi biao ren jia, uh, which is like sort of saying like you look at the person and you just know that they're scum or they're trash. Uh, it's an, a play on another phrase, yi bian ren cai, which means you take one look at them and you know they're a person of quality. So they're flipping it and saying, no, you take one look at me and you know I'm a piece of trash. Um, FFF Tuan, uh, I'll get back to that one in a second, uh, the FFF group, and then Diao Si. Um, so I want to explain Diao Si here. So uh, Diao Si, uh, quite simply, I'll use this definition from the Chinese web. I'll uh, translate it for you. They say they have no money, no background, no future. They love Dota, the game. Um, they love their menial jobs. Uh, they love the Diba. Uh, which is a particular um, space on the internet I can get into in, in a question and answer if you want to talk about. Uh, in front of the rich, uh, tall, and handsome, uh, they can only kneel. Uh, when they try to strike up a conversation with a female goddess, uh, all they get back is a chuckle, and they are the diao si. Uh, so essentially, uh, we have this phenomenon in China where young people are sort of like actively embracing this label and saying, yes, I am a loser. Um, yes, this is who I am. Uh, if we look at the phenomenon of the FFF ton, it's sort of uh, complicated to explain, but it uh, elicits it's coming from a Japanese anime uh, called Baka to Test, in which a group of people which scarily resemble sort of the KKK here, but in black robes with their scythes, um, go around policing relationships. Uh, basically, they're uh, known as being anti-relationship. They don't like people who are in successful relationships. Heteronormative, but also especially uh, sort of like homosexual relationships uh, get sort of clamped down on. So um, when we're talking about Chinese loser culture, 
Um, I think it's important to understand that unlike the uh, memes that I started out by talking about in the Western context, uh, that here it seems like this target of laughter is subtly reversed. Rather than finding humor in others' failure, young people are finding humor in their own collectively felt failure. Uh, and that this is becoming sort of a coherent identity, I would say, on the Chinese internet. Um, and while we can point to countless examples of failure in Western memes, there seems to be, in the sort of Western context, and you know, I could be wrong here, but there seems to be no single identity uh, that aligns with this sort of meme of failure or claims it. Uh, and as such, I have sort of talked about loser culture in China as what Raymond Williams has called a structure of feeling, a uh, kind of uh, collectively experienced affective state, um, which may hold political implications. Uh, so, for example, um, if we look at this slide here, you get the sense that uh, the Chinese government is very much aware of this vulgar language. Um, you know, the idea that these kinds of terms like diao si um, hold uh, radical political possibilities in the sense that they might just sort of create chaos or upset the order. Um, and I think that this is something important, is important to consider. Uh, so, you know, it, it's been suggested to me um, that well, some of my informants, for example, have suggested that Chinese loser culture may actually emanate from a traditional Confucius emphasis on modesty and humility. Um, they suggest that by belittling yourself, you show respect for others. But if we're really being true to the tradition, tradition would dictate that the truly sort of humble avoid attention-seeking behavior. But those who are employing the loser label um, are doing so, they're reveling in, in its virality, and they're using it as this point of social and emotional identification. Um, and I would argue that it seems more likely that they're skillfully sort of exploiting a traditional emphasis on modesty, sort of saying, I'm the loser, in order to level a thinly veiled critique at the unobtainable standards of success to which they are held. Thank you. Um, so I think uh, there are questions raised by this phenomenon, which is, does calling yourself a loser, um, does sort of talking about the fact that you don't have a girlfriend uh, and that uh, you don't want to uh, be associated with anybody who has sort of successful relationships, does that challenge the normative or does it reinforce it, right? And if we go back to uh, Lamore Schiffman's discussion of memes, she's noted that uh, many media texts actually display what she calls a bivalent sexual politics. They embody a certain rebellion against hegemonic masculinity, yet at the same time they reinforce traditional norms through the comic framing of their protagonists. Uh, and it seems that there may be uh, something similar going on here. But I think it is precisely this kind of semiotic openness of memes like Diao Si um, and also uh, the FFF group, which I realize I've done a fairly poor job of explaining to you all here, so I'm happy to explain it further uh, in Q&A. But it's the semiotic openness of this slang, right, which defies the attempts to fix meaning and therefore sort of allows these terms to gather some sort of emotional and political weight without falling victim to uh, state censors or social rejection. And so in this way, perhaps young people are able to subtly challenge strictures of conservative Chinese society which places an emphasis on heteronormative marriage, family, and career without appearing overtly resistant to Chinese norms and values. Okay, thank you. Cool. So up next is Anna Jobin. She's joining us from Switzerland. She's a PhD candidate at the University. I'm going to butcher this, but the Université de Sausanne? All right, got there. Um, if I can find the mouse, I might be able to open the presentation here. Yeah, that one. Okay, that can't be open. No, that's not you. Uh, try the PDF. Um, and 
Her talk is You're in Search. So, um, you're going to, yeah, you're going to have to balance this as a PDF. Um, so, the mouse is here, scroll down, and everything should be good. Right. So, yeah. What? I just, I can do full screen, right? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, it's not. Which green button? Sorry. Oh, no, yeah, but that's yeah. that's a keynote behind it. That's no, no, no. Not my um, the, let's see if we got that. I can do this. Uh, oh, there you okay, go. Great. Thank All right. You. Cool. Wonderful. Thank you. Technology. Okay. So at this uh, conference, I suppose I'm not surprising anyone by pointing out that the algorithmic systems um, and the corporations running them, the, co the systems we interact with are not neutral. And in my presentation, I'd like to go beyond theoretical claims and show very precise manifestation of this non-neutrality. And Switzerland is actually a very good example because it's a multilingual country. And so there are many gaps and breaks where this becomes very apparent. And um, I'll show um, how the search query charts of Year in Search, formerly called Go uh, Google Zeitgeist, are not uh, the objective mirror, big data mirror of society that Google claims it is. Um, my investigation into Year in Search have started almost two years ago as a personal side project during my PhD, because as everyone knows, a doctoral research project is not time consuming enough. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I've uh, approached it from different angle. Today I will present it how Year in Search um, could be otherwise, to use STS parlance, which means um, how uh, everything that is uh, reflected back to us through Year in Search by the proxy of our search queries is very partial and is already the result of certain interpretations. And I have been uh, inspired to do so by many smart thinkers and researchers that I won't be able to cite uh, all during uh, this very short talk, but um, I, I will, um, one of the crucial influences has been Nick Caldry and his inaugural lecture at LSE where he suggested that in order to dispel what he called the myth of big data, we must focus on the gaps and breaks on our languages of social interpretation that are authorized by the myth of big data. And he reminds us that the social is something that is interpreted and not simply measured. The biggest problem with big data then is not the information we are given that might be wrong because we can point out it is wrong. It is the information we are not given and don't know we are not giving and therefore we cannot even make it exist and we cannot make sense of it. So 15 years ago, Google published their first year-end charts of popular search queries named Zeitgeist, alleging to provide a glimpse at what captivated the world over the past 12 months. And it promised to reveal the collective focus of the online mind in form of the most popular search terms as they occurred throughout 2001. And already it was not one list, but several lists, with categories ranging from 9-11 to movies and many more. And you may also notice the wording centered on competition and winning and losing, and as well as the objectifying mention of women as a category alongside music and brands. And so from a few English charts in 2001, Zeitgeist has since evolved into a year-end publication of numerous country-specific charts, and it has been rebaptized Year in Search. The video promoting the 2015 version declares that the question we asked ourselves revealed who we are, explicitly claiming that search queries we type into Google reflect the very essence of us. So from 2008 onwards, there has been a Google site as Switzerland showcasing the spirit of the times of Switzerland in form of ranking charts. And if I present the case of Switzerland, as I said, it is because, well, I'm familiar with it <laughs> and with its specificities. And those specificities are very uh, great examples of how this big data uh, we are presented, how there is no neutral logic behind it. 
Okay, examples. Let's start with the categories, which are not the same in every country, and they're not the same every year, and there's no explanation about why certain categories exist and others don't, why they change. And this is the first indication that maybe relevance is not a universal stable principle. And there's not only the nature of the category, there's even the language in which the category is presented. And this is where the Swiss example gets interesting, because Switzerland has three official languages spoken in different regions of the country, German, French, and Italian. And German is uh, about double the size, also numerically, of the other languages, but that has no impact on the formal official status of the other languages. But the categories titled in, in, in Year in Search Switzerland have always been either in German or English, never French or, or even Italian. And the default language of online services in Switzerland being German is, by the way, a recurrent problem. And this already translates a powerful image of what Switzerland is. It is not all of Switzerland, it's just the red part, the German-speaking part. As a contrast how it could be otherwise, I'll show you a year in search Belgium, another multilingual country where category names are bilingual. And speaking of languages, that's just an anecdote, but when digging into the archive, I suddenly realized that the Switzerland Zeitgeist 2001 now has partly Swedish content, which shows that databases get shuffled around and they get moved and created and recreated. So, but back to the principal topic. It's not the same country, Switzerland, Sweden, right? So, okay. Let's go one step further and take a closer look at the, at the categories. I mean, what is the difference between people and Swiss celebs? Are Swiss celebs not people? Um, and what is, why distinguish between travel destinations and local places in a touristic country where many local places are actually well-established travel destinations? And so if you, we go further down the, that road, what seems like a nice little informative list at first suddenly becomes very random. It gets even more random when we look not only at the categories or their titles, but also their content. So if you look at the, the words that are listed, uh, because um, they are far from self-evident. It is very unclear what it takes to become a trending Swiss celeb, according to Google. Strangely enough, one of the people listed is in fact Austrian, so that must have been a mistake. Two people have been involved in a money scandal in 2012, otherwise we wouldn't know their names. Um, two people, uh, some are sports people, someone has won a TV talent competition, and two people on the list have in fact died during the year, so that's a very sad reason. In the US it's distinguished between pe diseased people and living people, two different categories, because it's... Okay, great. Um, Another example is from 2014 and lists trending Swiss events. And the air show, Air 14, um, held every, I don't know, I think six years, is number one. Paleo Festival ranks second. And the so-called Paleo Festival is in the French, it's, it's a fe music festival from the French-speaking part of Switzerland. Uh, thank you from the French-speaking part of Switzerland, and that it shows up in the top 10 list is really great news. Because as you might have guessed, with a numerical majority being Swiss-German, it is really, really hard for places, names, uh, uh, people from the French or even it let alone Italian-speaking uh, part of Switzerland to even make it into these lists that are based on purely numerical logic. Um, so it's very nice to see Paleo Festival uh, ranking up there, even though if it's not number one. But um, wait, because when we look at the ranking Google Trends, and now you see how we lack, uh, how we lack actual tools to criticize the, that, that information knowledge is presented to us when we need Google tools to criticize Google. But um, it works because we see that, <laughs> notice that Air 14 has had more searches than Paleo Festival in 2014, but Paleo, without the festival, has had even more searches than Air 14. And it's the same distribution as Paleo Festival, so it's obviously the festival and not the diet. Paleo is the privileged search expression for French-speaking people. No one speaks of Paleo Festival. We'll say Paleo. You're right. And my guess is that Google algorithms were able to identify Paleo Festival as an event thanks to the wording festival, but it is not in line with actual usage. 
And then suddenly, I think we should check another popular music festival in the French-speaking part of Switzerland, the Montreux Jazz. Has anyone heard of it? So Montreux Jazz. Montreux Jazz, surprisingly, has also been searched for more than Air 14, but it isn't even listed in a top 10. And then you realize that the ranking list we've seen previously, they don't necessarily show you the most search queries. They actually distinguish, they mix most searched and trending. And trending compares the number of searches to the one of the numbers of the previous year. And so, of course, annual events lose, to use Google's uh, rhetoric. Um, and by the way, this explains why Swiss celeb Roger Federer, for instance, was not listed as number one Swiss celeb. He would probably be number one of the most searched Swiss celeb every year. And this would be very boring. Uh, so Google <laughs> uh, promotes the new disproper disproportionately at the expense of other sorts of interest. So what? So what, you might say? What appears, as, what appears as an unimportant imprecision is actually a very precise indication of what is potentially happening every single, in every single one of these lists, in every country, every year, with every one of these expressions listed, and even with the ones not listed. So it might be a tiny example, but it is a big warning not to take these results at face value. So this, thank you. There are important limitations with regard to local context and linguistic specifications. Entire communities have become almost invisible. So in short, year in search says a lot, um, probably says more about Google's worldview, which is a very positivist worldview. There's only one reality, and it can unambiguously be represented by data, the bigger the better. And the world without pornography, I don't know if you've noticed, but no Swiss people ever search for anything pornographic on the web, right? But with always something new, every year something new, something more to look out for. And with many categories uh, bizarrely uh, linked to uh, very commercial categories, watches, cars, brands, consumer goods. I wonder why. We can talk about this in the Q&A. <laughs> um, so it says more about Google and not necessarily about our worldview. And this is where I want to come back to this rhetoric of us and we. Uh, because again, that um, Colry in the same lecture, he used that when alluding to uh, we use Facebook now, something Mark Zuckerberg said. I think the same applies to Google. We use Google now. So what is we? The collectivity of everyday people everywhere. Vague as it is, this claim grounds any number of specific rhetorics and judgments about what's happening, what's trending, and so by a self-accumulating logic about what matters for government, society, business, and for us. And while the goal, it is impossible to represent social life fully in search query charts, it is, of course, but Year in Search fails to acknowledge just that. The empirical examples show very well how Year in Search is an invitation to look at the world in a very specific way. And the hermeneutics of Year in Search are based on the premise that it is only showing what is already there. I'll just finish my sentence. So <laughs> I've tried to show it's, it's not show, only showing what is already there. It is creating what it is showing at the same time. And not only is it creating the reality, it is also creating us, a very ominous collectivity of people everywhere. Thank you. Get out of there. Cool. Um, up next, we have, uh, we're going to move from Switzerland to the UK. We've got Scott War coming from uh, the University of Warwick. He's a PhD candidate at the Center for Interdisciplinary Methodologies. Uh, also writes about contemporary art. And his paper will be titled The Meme on Circulation. So I'm assured, I, I was rest assured that there were going to be plenty of memes in this uh, slideshow. So let's see what happens. Not that many? Oh, all right. <laughs> um, yeah, so it should be. Boom, so that play button whenever you're ready. Uh, where, I can't see it from here. <laughs> Um, 
fuck All right. that? Yeah, I yeah, know. It's like a weird sort of... There you go. Cool. All right. So uh, in the abstract I submitted for this paper, I said I was going to ask two questions. But the way it kind of shake, uh, is shaken out is that I'm going to present a problem that begs a few questions at the end. And hopefully it's not too gnomic, but you can you know, throw your badges at me at the end if it is. <laughs> All right. On the internet, to err is inhuman. This network of networks can be idealized as connection, all flows and seamless commerce. But we most often encounter it through data fat pockets, platforms, that subject media to recursive processes of filtering, ranking, sorting, and aggregating. The reality of the net is lived as disjunction, protocols, bandwidth, latency, error, the translation, that is, of data across disparate layers of soft and hardware. We can abstract the net as a partial whole, something like Benjamin Bratton's accidental megastructure, what he calls the stack, something that generates specific effects at huge scale. But it's also a cable together series of spaces. This is my favorite picture of the internet. That's a shark eating the internet. <laughs> um, Sorry, it's also a cable together series of spaces. Any path through it, any edge that links nodes, is a kind of banal, irreducible movement. So this network of networks has created the conditions for a kind of media that exploits distribution, a quality that emerges with the internet's ability to disseminate and to scale. So what I want to call distributed media, media are ensembles that are not reducible to their parts. And I don't want to mean this in any metaphysical way. I don't want to sort of imply philosophical terms like apparatus or set or assemblage or multiplicity, but I mean it as a more or less ad hoc descriptor for media that more or less fall into groups autonomously. So distributed media might include things like clickbait, which is continuously iterated until it overcomes our apathy, spam, which is co-determined by the botnets that produce it and the filters put in place to catch it, the data that's continuously, oh, by the way, this is like a map of spam botnet hotspots. The data that's continuously produced, aggregated, and then mined for relational content. And most importantly to me, internet memes, popularly understood as digital media that are copied and varied as they spread. We can talk about Dawkins after if you really want to, but I can be bothered right now. Um, so distributed media produce what I want to call distributed effects. With each of these examples, an instance is really just an instantiation of a mu much larger process. So when we talk about a meme, we might mean an instance, something that finds us on social media. But when we talk about the meme, we could be referring to a meme type, like the lolcat macro. The meme is both singular and collective, instances that belong to a series and a series of instances. Neither can be reduced to the other. So when we make memes, we, we manipulate their basic parts. In this instance, a picture of a silly cat, the header and footer format, the impact font, etc. Our, in our, instan in sorry. our instantiation iterates the meme's type. Whilst we can swap out these parts and to some degree even graft memes together, we can't change them all without losing our meme's link to the meme. This is what I've been calling a smog. It's like the dog meme <laughs> meeting the smog meme. Um, <laughs> the meme might generate distributed effects, but only because it exists in distribution. So to finish butchering uh, Pope's famous aphorism, if to err is inhuman, to forget is mortal. The meme is subject to a distributed mode of digital entropy. Ah, oh, yeah, that's like meme series. Get the idea. So Constant Dillard's recent artwork, Jennifer in Paradise, shows us what happens when a meme falls into oblivion. The first version of Photoshop came with an image that users were supposed to edit, a photo of the then girlfriend and now wife of one of its creators, Jennifer, sitting on a beach in Tahiti. This image became one of the earliest photo-modified memes. But when Dullart tried to trace the photo online, all he could find in image search databases was a low-res version of the original, and none of the versions edited with the suite's effects. So this is an installation shot at Carol Fletcher in London, um, and he's like reapplied the effects that came with the original Photoshop. So the quality that sets the meme apart from the internet image that Maria Olsen describes is variation. When the memes no longer spread or varied, it's just a poor image, the reality of a life after. So I want to suggest that distributed media are doubly errant. They wander. The net is mediated by the platform and interfaces, soft or hard, that cut it up into joints. One of the strange effects this produces is that media can seem to appear to us as though from nowhere. What Bratton describes as the stack 
functions as though it were a utopia or an utopos, literally a non-place, something like a real abstraction. The effects of distributed media emerge out of their errant movements. Oh, Bratton again. Uh, I, I've also taken these from his website, just as a credit. So these media err in another way. Erring takes us off one kind of path and creates another. The distribution of this kind of media occurs through a kind of iteration that invites error. Memes are errant copies, instances belonging to series, bad versions, deliberate mistakes, wild combinations serendipitously calling in and out of context. So, the meme is in circulation, otherwise it just isn't. Okay, that's the theory part. So I wanted to stop for a moment and consider this word circulation, because I think it's actually really problematic for people into media theory, but also anyone who talks about media. So what I do basically is media studies. I have to worry about what we think media are in ways that are probably really pedantic to everyone sitting here, or maybe even useless, I don't know. Um, this is a symbol of the uselessness of what I do, but anyway. <laughs> I studied English, well I, I studied English Lit, so I tend naturally to be overly concerned with words and meanings in ways that completely bore most people, but there are ways of thinking about media that impact any discipline or profession concerned with them. So it's commonplace to say that media circulate. Newspapers have a circulation that describes audience reach. To circulate something is to disseminate it, to let it be passed around. Money enters circulation, moving between real or virtual wallets, and digital media circulate too. The notion is pretty basic to how we define distributed media like memes. If we wanted to extract a really basic definition of the meme from academic liter literature, uh, all the people um, referenced in the first paper, so uh, Limor Schiffman, uh, Wiggins and Bowers, people like that, it would be, to paraphrase, so this is a definition of a meme, a group that's collectively created and that circulates. But what is circulation in a really basic sense? It's usually understood as the movement of content through a medium. So I'd like to suggest, somewhat pedantically, admittedly, that this presents us with a problem. When we ask what is circulated, we get the answer content. But if we ask what is circulation, we get a tautological answer. Circulation is the circulation of content. Thank you. The concept, the concept of circulation of content is without content. The circulating meme appears from nowhere and as if, well, just because it does. This is really annoying and not only because I'm a pedant. I'd like to suggest that content is the death mask of its circulation, with apologies to Benui. If the meme is reduced to content, it has no utility as a concept. Okay, so circulation, from the Latin word circulus, the figure of a small ring which becomes a verb, circulare, I told you I studied English lit, to make circular and later mutates into the English word circulate, to spread or disseminate. Circulation describes something that comes back around. But to whom? Or to what? In my abstract, I proposed that I would ask two questions about circulating memes in this paper. I kind of ended up writing it backwards, so I'm going to ask them now. Uh, by way of concluding. So firstly, what's the return on a meme that is in circulation? The massive distribution of memes produces a kind of excess. Memes are in excess of their content. They give us back more than they seem to have. They are more than they appear to us. Second, what does it mean for a circulating meme to return? The meme teaches us that circulation is a process through which something returns, but not necessarily to us. I'd like to suggest that the meme that enters circulation returns to itself. So what does this mean, finally? Lots of scholars talk about memes as the products of producers. This horrible portmanteau term, producer and user, suggests that memes are an expression of the producer-user status of net users. I'd like to suggest something different, that the meme is circulation information, or information. It's the moving matter of the net, made manipulable, but not subject to mastery. Memes bring a little bit of net culture back to us, in all its ugliness and what little amount of glory it offers up, allowing us to participate in massive distribution. One of the things they mediate is this condition, constituting an aesthetic means to play with the massive distribution of the internet itself. Uh, just to credit, by the way, this is from Hito Stiel's recent work, Factory of the Sun. So this appearance, this mediation of distribution, this is the as if from nowhere. 
This is the way that we experience the scale, the non-reciprocity, the disjunction of the net. This is one way of making an aesthetics of the net. Thank you. Oh man, that, that image is awesome. Okay, uh, bear with me for a second, exit. Uh, and last but not least, we have Samantha Culp. She's a writer, curator, and creative producer who's been between LA and varying parts of China. Um, and her talk's going to focus, I'm gonna butcher this terribly, Taobao House? Taobao House, Chinese Digital Aesthetics and Global Contemporary Art. So, oh, you have a folder. Okay. I have a folder, which is, Keyno is Keynote going to work? I don't think he's going to work. Oh, so. Okay. You can do, why don't they have power? Yes. Yeah. That works. Yeah. yeah sure. Okay. How, All right. Just do full screen. Yeah. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. All right. Yeah. It looks like pixelated, but that's okay. <laughs> All right. Um, hi, I'm Samantha. <laughs> um, okay. Yes, so the title for this talk was, well, originally From Taobao House to Our House, which is the name of a famous book about art, and I just thought the pun is really funny. Um, so essentially, uh, first of all, to, who, if people don't know what Taobao is, Taobao, I'm going to explain a little bit more, but Taobao is the, um, the biggest uh, e-commerce platform in China. Um, and I want to start out, though, by doing sort of a little game, just to start, which is... I'm going to scroll through a few images. There's going to be a lot of images in this. I'm going to try to go pretty fast with them. Um, but I'm first going to show a few images and just kind of, uh, if you want to show hands, like whether you think this image was made primarily as a work of art um, or don't, don't show your hands if you think it was made for some other reason. No? Maybe art? Could be art? Maybe? This one art? Or for a different reason? Yeah. Art? <laughs> Art? Which left? Maybe art? Anyways, it's, it's hard to take a I wish we had, like, we could have noisemakers or something. Um, anyways, yeah, so left side, right side. Uh, these ones also, I mean, deliberately, I think I started picking ones that were really similar. So essentially, of the majority of the past ones I've just shown, um, this one is made by Dis Magazine, so this was kind of from an art context. Um, here on the left side, that was from an art context. And on the right side here was also from DIS, from an art context. Um, the rest, and both of these, are from Taobao. Um, but they're really weird images. So I wanted to start out by talking about um, the term post-internet art um, is a really complex one. People are still fighting about it, um, but has risen, you know, arisen as a art historical category, kind of ad hoc one, and um, definitely a source of hype in the commercial art market in recent years. Um, though people are still debating it, I think the themes and visual characteristics by now are pretty familiar. Some would say cliche, um, from fetishized energy drinks to stock photography, aggressive logos to sinister beauty products, um, potted ferns to broken electronics. Um, the tropes of post-internet art are recognizable, and if nothing else, um, I think they're going to mark a certain moment in visual culture as strongly as maybe op art graphics in the 1960s. Um, they've also arguably become a meme um, in the sense that they uh, leave traces across the spectrum from gallery sanctioned artists to emerging Tumblr creators and kind of intimates the blurring line between the two of those. Um, so the thing that I was interested in is how uh, I think it's not been explored as much the phenomenon of post internet art in a globalized world. Um, particularly its underexamined relationship to the digital and infrastructural aesthetics of contemporary China. So having lived and worked in China for the past decade, that's what interested me. Um, and this is the basis of this kind of ongoing research project. So uh, I have, let's see, maybe little, I'll just go straight into what is Taobao. So Taobao is uh, a platform that was created as part of Alibaba Group. Hang on. So Alibaba was... Formed in 1999, um, Jack Ma is one of China's wealthiest men, founded it. He had been a, um, an English teacher. He uh, knew the story of Alibaba and the 40 Thieves. And when he was picking a name, getting, getting into being an entrepreneur, oh shoot, this doesn't show my whole slide. That's weird. Okay. Um, he was asking around, found that everyone knew Alibaba as a name uh, and decided to name the company after that. So essentially, Alibaba began as a, uh, a, a 
a conglomerate of then many different companies connecting, especially becoming a middleman between factories and buyers and manufacturers of different kinds around the world connecting to Chinese factories. Um, what I thought was super interesting was this, you know, the, also another reason he says behind choosing the name Alibaba was the poor woodcutter who discovers the secret of a thief's den um, and enters it with the phrase open sesame. Um, and he said that, you know, Alibaba open sesame for small to medium sized companies. Um, in 2003, Taobao was created as the kind of consumer facing platform, especially at that moment to try to beat um, eBay, which was trying to come into China. Um, and hang on a second. Then uh, soon after, also there was T Tmall is more specifically for business to consumer kind of official labels and different brands. Um, at this point, Taobao is really the everything store um, com compared to like it's sort of Amazon plus eBay plus a whole bunch of different other kind of platforms that exist um, on the American web. Uh, combining them all, it's a place where you could buy anything from you know, uh, baby animals to real estate to anything in between. Um, there's also now a Taobao holiday, which is called Singles Day, um, which was originally created and I think this relates a little bit to Marcella's presentation about a kind of anti-couple kind of reason for consumption. So it's like if couples are buying each other things on Valentine's Day, why don't we all buy ourselves things and celebrate being single? So it's November 11th um, and was found, this was founded in 2009. These are some images from last year's two, November Singles Day event, which also featured a TV special with Daniel Craig and Kevin Spacey playing Frank Underwood as a, as a commercial. Um, and ultimately, uh, there was also a really great quote. This is, so Daniel Zhang, who's one of the, the chief executive right now for Alibaba, said uh, before the event started that this event, this day, this record-breaking season of Singles Day was going to mean the whole world will witness the power of Chinese consumption. That's a quote. Um, and he was right. <laughs> so they broke all their own records um, and made uh, processed $14 billion dollars of transactions in one day, um, which just to compare it to Cyber Monday, the US Cyber Monday of last year processed about 1.35 billion. So it's a lot bigger. So when you're living in China, so Taobao, you can find all kinds of things. A lot of Taobao um, is just like other things online, e-commerce for fashion stores, um, a lot of you know indie fashion brands that are on here. This is actually a friend of mine who has a store and a, and a label that's like fits totally in line with kind of international kinfolk hipster aesthetics. You can find anything, um, high and low, in between. Burberry has a really huge presence on Taobao. Um, so uh, so I, I think just wanted to put that out there as I'm going to go into the more weirder side of Taobao and kind of more mass, uh, you know, low products or things that are not kind of tied to um, aspirational lifestyle so much. Um, so when I was in China, trying to start buying things on Taobao if I needed to buy things for my apartment, um, what I quickly realized is that the images used to market products are really strange. Um, and so on the left side, th these don't show up as well, but on the left side, th these were kind of from my personal collection. I started just taking lots of screen grabs and saving images as I was going through this, also feeling like, you know, in the thieves' den, finding weird pieces of treasure. Oh, and Taobao means searching for treasure. So I think it became a source of visual treasure. Five. Um, uh, so anyways, this is some images that I started collecting. Um, the, and, and on the left hand side, you know, it's, uh, at a certain point also sometimes even with my limited reading skills, um, being unclear what was the product being sold. Like this was, I think for a beauty product, but it's like, is it for a, a dog that can climb a tree? Like, I don't, it could be because there's other ads for that next to it. Um, so there starts to be this kind of like what I was calling them Taobao surrealism. Like there's a certain visual aesthetic, obviously to catch people's eyes in a really crowded marketplace. So making really weird images to sell things. Um, and at a certain point also becomes unclear, what is the, you know, what's the image, what's real and what's not real? Like, is this an ad for a piece of art that's like a, you know, you hang on your wall? Or is it an ad where that, that clock is an actual object you're going to put on your bookcase? It's not clear. Um, so I got, I kind of got really into this idea and going back to uh, the original surrealists and um, the line of Isidore Ducasse, the, you know, uh, trying to, to aim for a beauty. The surrealists were aiming for a beauty, something as beautiful as the chance encounter of a sewing machine and an umbrella on a dissecting table. And thinking about these, you know, enforced juxtaposition of alien realities and kind of like object relationships um, in a new way. So I was collecting these. 
Parallel to that, I came across the work of Kim Lawton, who's actually a British artist based in China, works also really, really closely with uh, several other um, you know, net artists and DJs and people in China. And he had started, also with his girlfriend, a Tumblr collecting these similar images called Taobao Media. I really encourage you to go to it. I kind of thought about this panel being infinite scroll, that I could just scroll through the, this Tumblr for 12 minutes because it's great. So I'm just going to go really quick. Um, there's really a treasure trove of crazy imagery. But as I started going, spending more time, um, realizing also parallel to this was what I was witnessing from afar online, the rise of kind of the post-internet artists or, or people loosely affiliated with this term, um, even unintentionally affiliated with this term, um, and where these things started to become really similar. So there's some really amazing stuff. So I'm going th really, really quick. This one is crazy. So this is like a funerary object with Steve Jobs. Um, people, this looks like, is this an installation shot? I think that, and I started looking at so much imagery, they started to really blend together. Um, this was actually, I just found this yesterday. Um, so post-internet art, we kind of know some of the tropes. It become, we all become like Justice Potter, like we know it when we see it kind of feeling, or at least that's how I felt. Some things here, this in the upper, upper left-hand corner, that's definitely from Taobao, that product, because I've seen that advertised. It's like a home spa. So anyways, what has Marissa Olson defined post-internet as being, um, you know, uh, instead of being after the internet, being in a space and in a time where everything, all of cultural production is so inextricable from the internet, and that's its main qual qualification. Okay, so what I thought was really interesting, why are most of the artists engaging with this and uh, named as part of this, mostly from Europe and America, even my friends who curated this show at UCCA in Beijing, um, Art Post Internet, two years ago, was primarily, there were no Chinese artists in this show. Um, so of some of these uh, entities involved with this term, um, and uh, these, these images that I find kind of start to really collide and blur of which comes from where. I'm naming a few here just as I'm going through. Um, w what is this? Um, I think there's a little bit of um, a question of, and as we're looking at vaporwave is another kind of micro genre affiliated with this, uh, which has some really clear cut kind of orientalism of uh, adopting, appropriating imagery from, from uh, you know, kind of vintage Japanese video games and using Japanese and Chinese characters for this ambient kind of exoticism. Um, this is just several different artists working with this. But for Vaporwave, I think there's a really clear Orientalist uh, thrust to some of that production. Um, for some of the other stuff, and this is obviously going back to the long history of Orientalism in Western, Western art and the history of art, um, but I think for what we're seeing with post-internet and the sort of Taobao aesthetics um, is more like it's a material of the internet. It's part of the sort of collective unconscious of the internet um, and materials being drawn from that. It's another ready-made. Um, and I think what's, what's increasingly quite interesting is people working on topics of the sort of object-oriented turn and like the post-human kind of philosophies emerging, um, thinking about hyper-objects and is, uh, you know, Taobao sort of, a, and the whole global supply chain connected through Chinese factories, uh, a hyper-object in itself. Um, uh, also thinking about these other spaces online where people think about surrealist imagery of objects acting autonomously. Um, this is, okay, that's almost the end. So I think there's something that is both very connected specifically to contemporary China, what's going on right now, also just as China is the vanguard of so many things, that's where kind of this post-human kind of object-oriented anxieties are arising first, and uh, there's a lot more there I can go into individually. Thank you. Let's see, is this... Okay, is this mic working? Yeah, cool. Um, I was really happy to moderate this panel just because I think it really gets at a essential kind of question about what we think about with the internet on a global scale. And when we move away from the specific kinds of norms that were usually embedded, uh, that, are, that are usually presented in say in a North American context or a uh, Western context per se. And that really I think gets to a specific kind of context of how to describe memes, how to talk about art, how to talk about the internet, what it is, in a way that I think is exciting and interesting. So to continue the conversation, we have just over 20 minutes for Q&A. Um, I would ask if you have a question, 
please feel free to come down so that we can capture the question on the live stream and so people know what's being asked. So, Edward? Of course, I decided to sit in the middle to ask a question. So, um, uh, the, the Dao Se culture, you, you said it defined um, sort of an attempt to, uh, it defies attempts to have a fixed meaning. And I was wondering if this is sort of like a, and then watching the other presentations, I was thinking maybe this is, um, is this sort of a defining characteristic of internet-based cultures, uh, like maybe globally, or is it just, uh, is it sort of just a Chinese internet-based culture thing? And then this is for sort of everyone as well to take on. Like the idea of a defying an attempt to have a fixed meaning. Sure. Yeah, thanks for your question. Um, so I don't think it's just something that exists only within the Chinese context. I think absolutely so much of um, the mimetic content and especially um, sort of how I opened with all of the various fail memes, they kind of defy any one one specific meaning, right? But I think that there is a sense in which DLC as a phenomenon and the, the various things that are associated with it are um, really uh, purposefully ambiguous. I think that that a lot of, um, certainly language on the Chinese internet functions with a double meaning, uh, one that you know, could be something that's critical or it could be something that's simply people making fun of themselves um, and that that's a very conscious choice of netizens in China to use that type of language in order to try and get around things like censorship, right? So, but, but I do think that that ambiguity, again, um, is also part and parcel of memes more generally. I don't know if anybody else wants to. Um, just a slight side comment. I think one of the hardest problems with studying things like memes, for me anyway, maybe just because I'm crap at using big data, is that like you can, after the event, when you're looking at something um, over time, you, you can isolate how something has changed. But when you're immersed in it, like the change is minimal or they happen really quickly and they pass you by. So there's that old semiotic problem of like the simultaneous versus the, the historical. And so um, it's, it's really difficult to nail down your object and say it does change or it doesn't. It's just a comment. OK, cool. I uh, thought I saw a hand somewhere there. No, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Samantha, what is the name of that amazing Tumblr you were showing us? Oh, it was at the bottom of it was at the bottom of the slide. It's just, it's Taobao Media dot Tumblr dot com. That's that's the website. I would spend time there if I were you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> saw your hand first, Dick. <laughs> So China is home to 25% of the global workforce. And for the most part, it is pretty uh, ideologically apolitical or not very actively organized. And I was wondering if there are sort of the auspices of a class consciousness emerging in any facets of Chinese internet culture right now. Um, yes, I mean, I think that I, I read uh, class friction into, um, certainly into Diaosu as a phenomenon. I think that there is a very pointed way in which people who are claiming that label are doing so to claim that they are not part of the privileged elite within China. So you would, um, people, there's been a, a great deal of critique leveled at the first, what are known as the first generation officials, children, and first generation, um, you know, wealthy. So people who are part of the 1%, you could think of it almost as a Occupy Wall Street 99% sort of argument that I perceive as having something to do with this Dielsa phenomenon. But I mean, that that is, um, touches on only this one area that I look at. I mean, absolutely, you have... Um, people who are using the internet in China to level critiques at 
um, at corrupt officials, at the lack of sort of representation for workers. I mean, I think it's just a huge question. I'm not sure exactly how to pinpoint it. I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess the thing I would add is to say, I think the, the first thing you said, not just to be like, that's wrong, but like to say China is not a political place is not accurate at all. <laughs> like, It's extremely political, whether you have kind of, well, and you have activists, you have groups of activists, you have networks of activists um, in a very precarious kind of situation that's constantly mutating, but um, it is political and people think and talk about politics all the time, um, even if they're not voting. Uh, yeah, that's what I would say about that. Okay. <laughs> uh, yep. Thank you. Um, I was struck by the utility of Scott's idea of circulation, sort of implying something that just loops back around to the same thing and maintains the same. And it's maybe actually more useful than thinking about uh, objects, hyper or not, or images. And I wonder if all of these things were thought of as circulations, where does that take us? And is that a way of thinking through all of these different uh, sort of empirical objects we're looking at? Yes. <laughs> no. But I'm obsessed with this, uh, this concept, obviously, and, and think it can be used to explain everything. So, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think if we had planned better, I think obviously your presentation was really uh, uh, meaningful for mine too. I think I, when I'm approaching this and kind of having looking at the sea of images and trying to figure out like, you know, chains of causation or influence, and it's really unclear, um, I think even less so than with something clear cut like here's a dog meme and here's how it spread or your searches for that thing um, and kind of in the soft realm of like slight kind of tonal aesthetics and like colors and like just the nature of stock photography or wh whatever and why did that become more popular or have a start to have an edge to it and when did that happen I don't know uh, but I think it's super interesting and I think yeah worth looking at just say one more thing because that was a horrible answer to um, I think that what is interesting to me with this sort of talk of big scale internet all that kind of thing is trying to think you know, we always think about memes or whatever in terms of meaning and how they're used um, culturally. But uh, Sibylla Kramer, a German media theorist in a recent book, argues that um, one of the ways of looking at circulation is to think about the extrinsic, the outside. And if we think about things moving and as an outside rather than anything that we can get to, then maybe that gives us a way to think about the hugeness of the internet, its non-reciprocity with us, the way it affects us without us being able to affect it back. So, yeah. Just add one, one quick thing, which I didn't touch on, and I think I would love to hear Marcelo's thoughts on this too. So for, for China specifically, because of the rise in recent years of WeChat, which is a whole other you know conference about that, um, which is a messaging platform that also kind of rolls in essentially like WhatsApp, Skype, PayPal, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, everything. It's like everything in one. And the fact of that not being... Um, porous even between Chinese users and, and just you're not following anybody that you don't already know or maybe unless it's a brand um, and the same thing happening here the sort of siloization of these platforms and about the kind of flow then between platforms is changing and I think that something like obviously with like Taobao or Alibaba or artists searching for some weird plastic fabricator to make something that's still aspects of why some of these things get circulated but like Chinese you know uh, artists in China and America aren't both trading Diaosa memes back and forth um, partially to do with language and culture and just distance and whatever but also I think increasingly because of the platforms changing. I'll just quickly add to that that I was at a, a conference called the China Internet Research Conference that meets every year, just last year, and the topic of conversation was um, internet in China or the Chinese internet, right? Um, and, you know, you have to be really uh, conscious of that question and the sort of uh, false... I think what you're pointing to this this sort of false notion that we're all connected and we're all trading these things and um, yeah absolutely um, there there is a way in which um, much of what's going on especially in WeChat is very insular and it's not it's not like a public platform that's being watched and and um, you know that people are able to access from anywhere absolutely. Yeah, and I guess to throw another dimension on that, right, going to Anna's talk, uh, the relationship between language, right? Like, just because... Hmm? Oh, yeah. 
I can extend in that because it's completely the opposite. It's a very small country with not a, enough a big. It's not a, a big market. It's a rich market, <laughs> but it's not a big market. And so uh, the news, uh, Google News for it for Italian speaking part is non-existent. So you'd actually only get Italian uh, uh <laughs> headlines and not even the Swiss Italian newspapers. And so it's actually the, the very opposite. It's not. It's it cannot be insular and it cannot even exist anymore because. And there's there's example. It's not just Google, as I said. Uh, there's other platforms. eBay uh, has never. Um even uh, I think they haven't even f made a French version of their platform, and uh, so they have not been had success. And then they finally they stopped business. Amazon for a long time it was well, it still is linked to Amazon.de, which is uh, Germany, uh, and p so p if, uh, <laughs> with free delivery at one point. And so uh, people speaking French had to actually <laughs> order things in German if they wanted free delivery, or use the French platform but pay for delivery, and. Uh, so <laughs> there's no Amazon Switzerland. Wh wh what language would it be, right? I don't know. Yeah. Oh, I saw you in the back. Uh, Corey. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hi. Oh, uh, do you mind? Yeah. Sorry. Hi. Uh, this one's for Marcella again. Um, I was wondering about the whole identifying as trash thing because. All of my friends and me are queer and trans, and we love calling ourselves like, oh, I'm just like a garbage queer or whatever. And like, there's a big history of working class people and like punks identifying as scum because that's what people are calling them. And so I was wondering like what it means to identify as trash and how that sort of changes with like intersections of race and gender and sexuality, especially when it's happening in like the UK and the US and in China and like such radically different societies and contexts. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, I think that's uh, a really interesting question and one that I am I'm really fascinated by with this phenomenon because there are many elements of it that I didn't get to talk about. Um, there's a whole phenomenon of uh, people using slang, uh, that's a term gaoji, uh, which means to act gay, um, and young men sort of seeking out close male friendships, but then maintaining that they are heterosexual. And that, you know, within the context of China, certainly we're talking about a place in which non-heteronormative is, is really stigmatized. Um, and I think that there is a sense that diaosi, that calling yourself a piece of scum or um, using these, these terms uh, could be... Uh, moving towards acceptance uh, for people, a, a place where they can sort of exist within that identity. But then there's also this sense in which it's actually totally opposed to being more acceptance. It may actually be reactive and, as I was saying, sort of like reifying the normative. Um, and I'm really not sure which it is. I think it's both. It's all at the moment. So that's as best I can say about that. Cool. No, you're good. Um, yep. <laughs> Hi. I was wondering, um, Samantha, if you could unpack what you meant about post-human um, and object-oriented. I felt like you sort of crammed that in at the end, but I'd be curious to hear more about that. Sure. Um, well, I feel like probably a lot of other people here may be better um, up on this than I am. Uh, but so there's been a sort of new uh, thrust in philosophy um, and then, of course, bleeding into art criticism world of recent years about this term like object oriented ontology, which is also related, I think, to a constellation of other terms like speculative realism and sort of like dark materialism. Um, and I think Again, I've heard philosophers criticize the art world for like not really getting it and just kind of picking up on these because they sound cool or like and you know forcing these equivalencies. So I don't really know um, if if it totally fits or not. But um, the idea, I mean, the, the short definition of that is sort of um, you know a world in which objects uh, are kind of have their own subject, well, not subjectivity, um, are have their own entity. Um, relationships and exist in that in a way that is not centered on the human. Um, and uh, I don't know, I feel like, do you have any other <laughs> de quick definition on that? Um, probably other people 
in this room might. But um, so I, I feel like that's been a, a thrust in the art world um, towards some of those things, and especially with some of these um, so-called post-internet artworks that have a lot to do, I think, with sort of objects doing things and behaving like in in ways. And again, back to some of the surrealist thing, like the surrealist didn't call it oh oh oh, but this idea of like uh, the the sewing machine and um, an umbrella together on an operating table. Um, what are these relationships going on between objects um, that have nothing to do with us? And I think that's a big question, which uh, also when you're looking at kind of factory and manufacturing and the, the decreasing you know role of the human or even how you know s questions of scale um, and things then also related to Timothy Morton talks a lot about climate change in this term too of these kind of like objects that are way bigger than human comprehension, such as the entire process of our climate and geologic time changing. Um, and we can't even grasp it. We have no agency in it whatsoever, but it's totally real. Um, that's a little kind of thing on that. Do you have anything? Oh. Um, I was also like kind of thinking about that and coming from the opposite direction, knowing nothing about art. Um, but thinking about the suggestion from last night's keynote, if you were there by, uh, I think it was Judith, who said the bots as a form of like interactive text and kind of like the next level of evolution in terms of the novel. And like, what does, how, how does one even begin to start like trying to figure out what a top level bot looks like, what certain bots do and so on and so forth. Um, I, you know, I don't quite know where that goes in an artistic turn, but it definitely seems like something that would be post-human and kind of like an almost literary art form in some capacity. Yeah. But yeah, that ran over. Um, we, we have time for a couple more if anyone's, yeah. <laughs> no? Um, oh, wait, did I miss? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this question is for Marcella. Um, kind of want to ask about your thoughts on, kind of, um, or if you've like done any research um, around kind of Western ideals influences on these uh, the, uh, people who identify with the um sort of concept. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's an interesting question and one that I haven't, um, to be honest, like entirely thought about. Um, the origins of that particular term are so specific to this really bizarre case of sort of mocking that was going on on um, the this uh, Tiaba, this, this Baidu site where people were sort of um, calling each other's names, and it, it's the, the terminology that came so specifically out of um, this Chinese cultural context that I haven't th thought to investigate it, but I do think that uh, maybe there are ways in which this, if I'm calling it this sort of like burgeoning sense of like class consciousness, is picking up on certainly, you know, young people sort of picking up on this sense of being left out uh, of wealth feeling that they are not uh, able to access uh, the sort of means of becoming wealthy within their country that's very much in line with a lot of the unrest globally among youth who feel disenfranchised, who feel that they don't uh, have a voice and that they don't have a way of sort of climbing the ladder to success. So I think that there are connections. I just don't know um, exactly how that works. Um, yeah, so we're almost at time. If there are any, f if there are any final questions, we have time for one more maybe. Um, but I also know food is between here and now and I don't want to keep you. So going once, going twice. Yeah, go for it. Do it. <laughs> Sorry, um, another China-related question uh, for um, Marcella. I think um, <laughs> uh, you talked about how there was a certain like ambiguity of um, like of meaning, and also about censorship. Um, so I was wondering if you could comment on the idea of like Huo Xingwen. I think it's called the Martian language, which is when um, like um, like underground or especially like politically. Uh, edgy people 
um, they use they substitute Chinese characters with more archaic versions like that are homophones to like space to speak more freely about political things like could you comment on that a little bit <laughs> or <laughs> thanks I'm sure Sam I'm sure you could comment on this as well I mean uh, I actually haven't uh, I haven't heard the the term that you use the Huaxing one the the um, Martian language, but I mean, I've I've heard it referred to as like, um, you know, discussion of like the mythical creatures of the Chinese internet, um, the Tony Ma, the grass mud horse, right? Is this this is what you're referring to? Is this sort of like double language? Um, so yeah, I mean, that's been around since the inception of sort of like uh, the Ch the Chinese censorship of the internet, right? That. Chinese language is something where you can very easily use homophones. You can change the intonation. You change the meaning. Um, I think it's interesting what's going on now is that it's, you know, the, the Chinese uh, government has expressed its desire to crack down on this kind of vulgar language and this kind of pun language. Um, and that, uh, you know, it's like a cat and mouse game. I mean, I think actually... Um, An Xiao Mina, who I think is following the conversation but isn't here with us, um, gives a really great example of another way of evading censorship, which is through visual memes, right? How do you censor a, a photograph? Um, because you can't censor that as easily. You can keyword search and censor these keywords that are constantly evolving. Um, and that's the other thing, is that they're going to change. You censor one, so they're going to find another way of saying the same thing. Um, but yeah, there are you know no limits to the ingenuity of um, sort of the Chinese netizens in terms of how to get around censorships, to talk about what they want to talk about, essentially. And I mean, just to go back to that, I think that in and of itself is political, right? So... All right, and with that, we are right on time. Beautiful. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, I mean, I've got nothing to say. Go eat. See you at the keynotes. At six. At six. six. Six p.m. Be back. Six p.m. The theater. It's up there. Can't miss it. <laughs>